Is it time for a mind shift? If you don't know what that means, then join your host, Dr. Clint Haycock, a former evangelical Christian pastor and Bible college teacher of over 20 years, along the journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of faith, life, religion, and spirituality. I'm really happy to welcome a good friend of mine we've met, I guess, through Facebook, I suppose it is. Let me see if I can pronounce your name right. Bruce Geringser. Is that correct? Geringser. we are close enough. Yeah. <laughs> so close. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, man, I was going to... One thing about you, though, Bruce, I will say, you're the first guest I've had that's got a better beard than mine. You've got a fantastic beard. Thank you. Thank Everyone, you. Everyone, you know, must compliment you on that beard. It must have taken decades to grow that out that long. Yeah. Well, actually, about... Uh, going on four years, I, I had a shorter beard before that. Of course, in my, I don't know, I was probably in my well, late 30s when I started, my grew my first beard. And of course, it was all red. I had really red hair back in the day. and But I have no red hair anymore. It's all gone. So. It's all gone. It's all gray. And I'm, my, mine's turning more and more gray every every minute, yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah, my... my uh, Oldest son, he's 40, he'll be 43, I think. And uh, he, I see more and more white in his beard every year as he gets older. And I said, well, you know what the future looks like, buddy, right here. Yeah, look right at it and see it, yeah. I know, my girlfriend keeps threatening. I should, she says, uh, you know, you're going to shave it off or keep it or what? You know, I've, I've cut it, shaved it off and grew it out again. And I've done all kinds of things with it, but I've never gone the full like ZZ top thing you've got going on because when I grow mine out, it just goes like out. It doesn't go down like yours. So I just, this is about as long as I get it and I leave it and that's it, you know? Yeah. It, and my wife prefers it. So, you know, that helps too. That you does know, help. I, I kind of a, a pudgy, you know, face without it. So I, this, <laughs> this hides all my sin. That so. it does. It can add a multitude of sin. Well, speaking of sins, we're talking theological language. I mean, we said before we hit record, it's funny because we were having a an absolute nightmare with the sound uh, audio. You, you couldn't hear me, but I could hear you. But once we got it connected, we said, of course, back in the old evangelical days, we would have said that was spiritual warfare. That would have been the devil trying to thwart this from happening, you know. So everything's couched in spiritual language as a Christian, isn't it? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and it's funny. We we were watching I don't know what television program last night and there was there was a couple lines that were said in the program and and you know I picked up right away on that kind of that spiritual language that was being used and it was so much a part of what our life you know we we just talked in a language that was very um abnormal I guess would yeah. be Christianese you know, and, isn't it it's Christianese well, yeah, yeah, exactly right. You know, and so we always gave God the glory and God the credit. And when things didn't go right, it was Satan trying to, you know, stop what we were doing. And so, yeah, yeah. And it's funny how now I'm at a place in life, you know, it's more of a, yeah, you know, when things like that happen, you know, shit happens. Let's yeah. kind of figure out what's going on. And, uh, you know, and, as far as giving someone glory or praise, I, I tend to give the praise and glory to whoever, uh, whoever it's due. Uh, you know, uh, Polly cooks a wonderful meal and she cooks a lot of them. You know, I don't lift my head, my hands towards heaven and say, thank you, Jesus. I, I say, thank you, Polly. Right. Because she's, she's the one. The who one. Did it. <laughs> yeah. She's the God in the story. <laughs> yeah, right. It's funny how it's it's a lifetime of unpicking that conditioning because I would I would say now I understand it as loaded language, which is yeah. you know straight out of cult psychology. Really, I learned that from Dr. Robert J. Lifton. This whole thing about every group has its insider jargon, and it's loaded with all sorts of meanings that only the people on the inside understand. So, as evangelicals, we would have understand things like you know, praying a hedge of protection over our lives and things like that, traveling mercies. Yeah. And I was watching a thing on Netflix the other night about some guy that does um, rebuilds racing motors 
And just before he did a stunt, he's a stunt car driver as well. He got his whole family together and they all prayed that God would provide a hedge of protection around them. And I thought, I know exactly <laughs> what he's talking about. Same thing as your example. The second you hear the language, you know exactly where, where they're coming from. Yeah, I'll get uh, over the years, I've had reporters contact me. They're writing, uh, for example, on the independent fundamentalist Baptist church movement and I know one reporter in particular on the East Coast, and he says, will you talk to me for a while? He says, I don't understand these words that they use. <laughs> and I said, and I laughed. Please and interpret said, for me. Yes. And, and he had a long list of things that he just simply, the language was foreign to him. To me, it was second nature, even though I've been out of it for a long time. That stuff's drilled in my head. It's never go- going away. You know, and so I think I was able to help him and others, you know, understand what they're really saying, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, when you they know. say dot, 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 what they really mean is this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes. When they it's say their blood, when their sins are covered by the blood, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> so many things. And only Christians know what they mean and it's applied to their life. Well, now this is the interesting part. I've loved reading your posts on Facebook. I've read articles on your blog that we'll talk. I'm sure we can talk about that a little bit later, but you come out as an ex pastor. So that's something right off the bat that you and I have in common. I was a pastor in the Portland, Oregon area for about 12 years. I was an elder and a pastor, but you were in it a lot deeper and a lot longer than me. How long were you actually a pastor? And you said you even were preaching before you were a pastor. Yeah. I, I started preaching at the age of 15 you know, and then a uh, year after high school, so at the age of 19, so that would have been in 1976, uh, I went to Bible college. And, and from there, I started pastoring churches in uh, Ohio and uh, Texas and Michigan. You know, all told, I pastored churches for, you know, 25 years. So, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, the ministry was all I knew. In fact, you know, when I tell people my, my life story, I, they asked me, well, you know, what did you want to be when you grew up? And I says, I always wanted to be a preacher. I was five, six years old when I told my mother that I wanted to be a preacher when I grew up, you know. And uh, so I never went through the angst that so many people go through of trying to figure out what in the world they want to do with their life. Preaching was always what I wanted to do. So, you know, that that's what I did. I As I look back on my life story, you know, it's not hard to conclude there there was no way that I wouldn't have become a preacher. You know, the, the, mm-hmm. the, everything was, you know, uh, stacked in one direction for me. So at, you know, 19 and off to Bible college, I went and, you know, met a, a young woman that was, you know, she was 17 when I met her and she was, uh, Polly was, went to college with the express purpose of wanting to marry a preacher. I mean, that was her she believed God wanted her to marry a preacher. And so what better place to find one than a Bible college? Yes. And she found me much to her mom's consternation. (laughs) (laughs) Probably now for sure. (laughs) Now that you're an atheist and all. Yes. Yes. I, uh, I definitely am blamed for everything. (laughs) You know, but you understand the, you know, in, in, in evangelical theology, I'm the head of the home. I'm the patriarchal figure in the home. I'm the decision maker, all that. So it stands to reason if if my wife and my children have gone astray, it's my fault. If I had just stayed in the ministry, if I had just kept preaching and going to church, and then they would all be on the straight and narrow path. But it, that kind of thinking forgets that everyone involved in this story has their own choices to make. I can't force anybody to do anything, nor would I want to. Mm-hmm. Am I glad that my wife came along with me in all of this? Well, absolutely. But, you know, we had that talk early on, you know, hey, if you, you chart your own path here and mm-hmm. where you want to go. And uh, now if she had stayed a fundamentalist Baptist, yeah, we would probably have problems. <laughs> yeah, I know. I want to get into that. But I want to ask you about that. What is it about preaching that has such an allure? Because when you were talking about your desire as a young boy to be a preacher, I can identify with that because 
I had a similar sort of drive when I was a young kid, and I, I would admire the great sort of preachers I would listen to on the radio, Christian radio. When I was growing up in a very fundamentalist home, we were only allowed to listen to Christian music or Christian radio. So I grew up listening to, you know, Jay Vernon McGee and all these guys, the, these people that you'd hear on the radio all the time. And I can remember when I was driving, I used to be a delivery driver in the Seattle area. I would listen to Christian radio all day long, just driving around and imbibe not only the message these people were preaching, but the style. And I would try to copy that, you know, you, you listen to famous preachers and you pick up phrasing and that those kind of things. What is it about preaching that's got such an allure? Because I can remember feeling a real awesome weight of responsibility as a young preacher going into, you know, homiletics classes at Bible college, preaching classes, learning how to preach, as it were, and thinking, you know, I'm preaching the word of God to these people and teaching them how to apply it to their lives. Did you feel that son of sense of responsibility as well? Oh, absolutely. You know, I certainly at the age of 15, you know, I went forward one uh, Sunday evening and I told the church that I had uh, believed that God was calling me to preach. And ironically, just a couple of weeks before that, I had got saved for real. You know, I was <laughs> during a revival meeting, as is common in the Baptist church for kids to have a, another religious experience when they're a teenager. So when I when I look, when I take a big step back and look at that time in my life, I say, what else was going on? Mm. Well, what else was going on is that my parents divorced. They stopped going to church. My whole family started going to church. And so, you know, but I kept going to church because the church became this surrogate family for me. And I give them a lot of credit. Mm. on that aspect they provided stability for me in a home where i even when we were going to church there wasn't much stability and there was absolutely none uh, after my parents stopped going to church mm. and it's a real can be a real sense of community huh yeah oh absolutely and all my friends were there and you know i was very much a normal heterosexual boy that had a real interest keen interest in girls and so what better place know, to be yeah yeah that's right and it was a large <laughs> church you know, back in the day. And so we had a large youth group. And so there was there was that draw and there was connection. But I think like you, I, I felt this burden that, you know, hey, death is certain, hell is real, and people need to hear the gospel. And I look back on it now, my youth pastor kind of took me under his wing. And, and I think he genuinely tried to help me, but I also now see that he was manipulating me. Mm -hmm. He didn't think he was manipulating me he was just doing what had been done to him and what he had been taught at baptist bible college to do and whatnot but fact is he he was trying to guide me in a certain direction and to believe certain things and to set my sights on on certain things and like you i was enamored by big name preachers uh in high school i would uh skip school and uh they would have uh, preachers meetings at the church I was attending, and I would I would go to those all day, you know, and listen to these preachers, and and I loved it. And like you, I over the years in the ministry, I, I took my craft seriously, and uh, I worked hard at you know giving sermons that you know made sense, were true to the text, and and at the same time were passionate and whatnot. Because if you're anything like me. I've heard a lot of sermons that ha were dreadful. Uh, yeah, I've awful. sat through many of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so and, many. You know, and... Uh, Cringeworthy. I, ne I never wanted to be that kind of preacher. Yeah, same I, here. i interested in, in what I was saying and be willing to sit there, you know, while I was saying it, so... I hear you. My big thing was narrative preaching. That was my sort of favorite thing to do was to preach like a first person narration type sermon sure. from sure. the pages of scripture, uh, you know, flesh out a Bible story, the story of David or, you know, whatever it was from the Old or New Testament. Those always seem to get people really interested and drawn into the what to the story I was telling. I mean, I was a master of the three points in the application or three points <laughs> in a poem thing, you know. The classic <laughs> expository, sort. that was my other thing, was probably like you. You know, you go through the text and you pick out verse by verse by verse and explain it and apply it and talk about the context and everything else. And that's what you do as a good preacher slash teacher, really, right. as far as what, what I was taught how to how to preach anyway. 
Yeah, early on, I was I was pretty much a topical preacher, and that's what was taught in that was what I was taught in Bible college. But I don't know I wasn't that many years into the ministry where I was exposed to teaching on expositional preaching and realized that that seemed to be a way to preach that was more faithful to the text of the Bible. And it also put an end to me chasing rabbits or, or deciding, you know, hey, I want to preach on this this week. And so instead, I preached on what the text gave me, you know, week after week. And, mm-hmm. and so hey. it eliminated some of, you know, that other stuff that, you know, in the back of your mind, you're saying, yeah, you know, this, this, and this went on in the church this week. And, you know, maybe I need to talk about that this week. Slide yeah. something in there. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, but of course you can't specifically mention the speci- you know the actual thing you're talking about. No. That was the problem somehow it found its way into the text as well. Well, I I did. <laughs> I I don't know what I was thinking. What time I I decided from the Bible I was going to address this whole thing of joining unions. I don't know how I came to the conclusion that the Bible was against unions, and so I preached on that. Uh, and of course, I only had two union members in the in the church, two school teachers. Well, you know, they rightly got offended and left the church over my sermon. You know, and I, I'm thinking, well, that was one of the dumbest things you ever did. You know, and uh, <laughs> what were you thinking? I, well, I was thinking at the time I was being true to God. You, you know how it goes. Yeah. Been, oh, yeah. It's what the text uh, says. Yes, and it's what being God. We have this connected relationship to the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, I was just preaching what God wanted me to preach. And if they didn't like it, that's that's on them, not me. Mm. And uh, I now look back on stuff like that and like that and say, no, Bruce, you were the problem, not them. Not them. <laughs> but now we talked about uh, loaded language as another category that comes to mind from Lifton's cult psychology, and that is sacred science. So he's got another category. Every religion, every religious group has its so-called sacred text. So if we zoom out from our discussion about the well, how important we saw preaching at the time, the Bible that we were preaching from, I think Lifton would say, yeah, it's a classic case of sacred science. I mean, we you must have believed you were in the independent, independent fundamental Baptist. The Bible was inspired, it was inerrant, it was infallible, it was authoritative, and that is what explains why preachers preach from the text Sunday in, Sunday out, week in, week in, year in, year out. They think the Bible has something, and I did too, it has something to say to our lives today, that we need to heed it, we need to believe it, we need to obey it, because that's the very Word of God. Is that how you saw it at the time? Oh, absolutely. The Bible was a supernatural book written by a supernatural God and given to the man of God to preach to the people of God. And I believe that with all my heart. And of course, that that belief is what ultimately led me down the path of deconversion too. But yeah. couldn't we, sustain it. Yeah. Yes. And we'll get to that in a minute. But yeah. yes, I, you know, sometimes I'll get atheists, especially lifelong atheists who kind of will take this approach of me and, well, you're 50 years old before you left the church. You know, what took so long? And and there's this subtle implication that you must not have been too bright, you know, that, <laughs> uh, you know, or you'd have figured it out before that. And I said, well, I never questioned my beliefs. I I believe the word of God was true. And, and that uh, if I didn't understand something, the problem was mine, not the text. You know, I read the same text that everybody else did. And I knew there were problem texts that didn't make sense or seemed to suggest that, you know, things that were not moral, not ethical. And but but I explained them away in my mind by saying, well, you know, God will make that clear to me someday because I know God is good. God is just and God would never do something that that wasn't according to his purpose and plan. And and so I just. I believe, you know, until I, until I didn't. And the fact is you and I, we were complicit in helping other people, you know, explain away their doubts and fears and concerns. Cause 
probably like me, you studied apologetics. That was another big part of my sort of quote unquote ministry. Not only did I preach every Sunday, but I taught adult Bible classes and things like that. Then I got into teaching at Bible college. So therefore, I was also into defending the faith, which is right. a part of helping people explain away their doubts and concerns and, and convincing non-believers of the truths of Christianity. Where did you stand on the whole apologetics thing? Oh, I took a very proactive approach and maybe a little different than some people. For example, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, cults were a big thing. And, you know, Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. And, and so I would teach classes, you know, uh, for adult church members on cults and how to recognize their false teachings and what does the Bible say about the, you know, these things. And, of course, the only cult that I didn't recognize was the one that I was a part of. <laughs> exactly. You know? I was just going to say, <laughs> you know, the thing about <laughs> Walter Martin, he, he defined a cult as anything that doesn't line up with Orthodox Christianity. Right. That was he wouldn't talk. He would say that Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses and things like that; those are cults because they're counterfeit. They're of Christianity. They they are in error doctrinally. He I know I remember him talking about the cult psychology aspect of it, but yeah, I never realized that myself either. Yeah, you know, and it, it's you know, of course, Martin, like most evangelicals, are presuppositionalists, and so you know they they start with this presupposition that what they believe is true and there's no question about it. There's no challenge to it. This is, we just know that this is true. And of course you find out, at least I did, and I'm sure you did that that simply could not be sustained. Mm -hmm. You know, the right way to go about that is to, to question whether or not that is true. What basis do we have to say that these religions over here are cults but christianity is not and especially when you start to think about you know the word cult itself i mean look it, it can be argued that virtually every organized religion is a cult of some sort mm -hmm. yeah but we use it more in a colloquial sense to where these groups that are heterodox or or heretical and we, we never see uh, you know but but I say that, but even within Christianity, I mean, we, you know, we thought the, the as a Baptist, I thought the, you know, the Church of Christ, you know, uh, the Campbellites, they were cultic, uh, the Apostolics with their, you know, oneness preaching. I thought, you know, they were a cult. And of course, the Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons. And, you know, I, I'm sure that Walter Martin would be rolling over in his grave as he sees if he saw that Mormons were being kind of embraced as being <laughs> yeah. Christian, you know. That's right. Yep. Yep. I used to listen to the Bible Answer Man every day on the radio. Fridays were my favorite because it would be like a sermon from Walter Martin. And a lot of times he would debate Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and people like that. And I always thought, my God, this man is he's so smart. He's so incredibly well versed in his argument. He would just destroy these people and prove beyond all reasonable doubt that they were, like you say, heretical and heterodox and a cult at the same time. When we get back in the second half of this conversation with Bruce, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name again, uh, we're going to be talking about this subject of what is the difference between evangelicalism, your typical mainstream evangelical church, and fundamentalism, because of course Bruce comes out of the IFB, the Independent Fundamental Baptist. What is it? What is the difference between the IFB, the fundamentalist side of Christianity, versus your typical garden variety evangelicalism? And then we're going to get into this issue of how do you rebuild your life after leaving religion? And in Bruce's case, and I guess in my case too, we were both pastors for a, a number of years. Bruce far longer than me. How do you rebuild your life? How do you sort of reconstruct? that sense of authentic identity and sort of get it all back together. So look for that in the second half, just coming up in a few minutes. I wanted to mention what's coming up here in the next few episodes here on Mindshift Podcast. I've got a really interesting conversation booked with 
Dr. Andre Gagne. I've had him on the show before a few years ago. In fact, it was Dr. Gagne. He's from Canada. He was one of the first ones who kind of got me interested in this issue of Dominion Theology. I think he was one of the first, if not the first, guests that I had on a few years back talking about Dominion Theology and talking about the Christian right, Christian nationalism, and that kind of kick-started my own personal journey of researching and investigating this movement in certainly not just the United States, but we see now around the world the spread of Dominion Theology and Christian nationalism. And so I'm going to have him back on. He's written a book. I think it was all in French, though. It was about the evangelicals behind Donald Trump. So we're going to get into that. For those of us that don't read French, that book would have had some limited appeal. So we want to find out what his book on the evangelicals behind Trump was all about. And then, as promised, I've been working really hard on getting this out there. I've got a couple of episodes worth of content on the controversial pastor, Doug Wilson, who some would say is running a cult-like empire out of Moscow, Idaho. He's kind of a second, third generation Christian reconstructionist. He's kind of sanded off some of the rough edges. But we're going to find out what exactly his message, his theology, some of the scandals that he's been surrounded by over the years, the decades really since he took over as pastor of Christ Church in Moscow, and then the influence that he's had in terms of the so-called Christian patriarchy or biblical patriarchy movement. In fact, just today, as I was getting up this morning, as I'm doing this recording, I saw a tweet about the manosphere issue. You know, I don't know if you know about this, but this is something, this is really a toxic movement. It's a secular movement, something in the incel community, but now it's crossing over into the Christian patriarchy movement. There was a conference held in Orlando, Florida, uh, and it was all about the 21 conference or 21 convention, I guess it was called. And you had two pastors speaking at this, basically a secular event about patriarchy and men taking charge of everything. And these two guys are in the orbit of Doug Wilson. They're both pastors and they're in that sort of orbit, the manosphere movement. So the really dangerous stuff going on, very toxic theology. So I'm doing a a lot of work on that, hoping to get that episode or two out. And I've also done a recording with David Johnson. He's a returning guest. We talked about a Christian defense of slavery, and that's something that Doug Wilson's also been affiliated with, with the book that he co-wrote back, I think it was 1996, with a certain Stephen Wilkins, who himself has been accused of being a racist. He was one of the co-founders of the League of the South. So there's some really toxic stuff coming out of Moscow, Idaho, the Doug Wilson orbit. So I'm working to get those episodes out, but look for the one with Andre Gagne as well as with David Johnson. In fact, speaking of David Johnson, as this episode comes out this week, it's still not too late. We have our October Mindshift Zoom call on the 23rd of October with David Johnson. We're going to be talking about his new podcast, Red Letters. What is it about the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels, at least as recorded anyway, that makes him not so much a great teacher. And this is kind of what he talks about in his podcast. So it's still not too late to get on that Zoom call by becoming a Patreon supporter of the show. And in fact, speaking of Patreon supporters, I wanted to give a thank you to Ross Galetto. I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. I think he's from Australia. We've actually got a number of supporters from Australia and New Zealand. It's really great to have them on our monthly MindShift Zoom calls, which like I say, you can become a part of that and get on this call this uh, month coming up just in a couple days as this episode drops with David Johnson. And then finally, how can you find me on social media? You can follow me on Twitter at MindShift2018. You can also get on the public Facebook page, the MindShift Podcast Facebook page. You can message me there. And in fact, I got a really great message just the other day from Carrie Gamble. She messaged me on the public Facebook page and she talked about how she had just discovered the podcast she's been deconstructing coming out of Christianity and it's been a real helpful kind of a life link for her so great to know a person like Carrie uh, and to know that what we're doing here on this show is helping people recover after they leave religion in fact speaking of which let's talk about that as we go back into the second half of this conversation with Bruce and again I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name because I know I won't get it right but we're going to continue talking about his journey from IFB pastor to atheism. Well, you were into it farther deeper than me because you were in the IFB. That's the one major difference. I was raised in Church of Christ and I, I did like community church sort of thing, but you were in the independent fundamental Baptist. How long were you in the IFB? And what's the difference between that and sort of your mainstream community type uh, church? Well, yeah, that's a good question. I was in the, the IFB 
from 1962 to somewhere in the, it's hard to pin it down when, when there was a transition away from that, but I'd say the mid eighties, uh, maybe 87, 88. Good where I 20 finally, years at least. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yes, a long time. And my wife's family is still all deeply immersed in that. They're preachers, missionaries, evangelists. Mm. Uh, Holly's dad was a IFB pastor uh, for a number of years. And so the difference between the IFB and evangelicalism is surprisingly not theology so much. I mean, if you go to your average IFB church in the community that you live in and ask them for their doctrinal statement. And you compare it to the, the average community church or the, you know, the garden variety evangelical church, you're not going to see much different, you know, salvation by grace through faith and belief and premillennial. Uh, yeah, pretty standard Orthodox. Yeah. 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 Where, where the differences come in, though, is how they apply the Bible. And it comes to the, the social aspects of the Christian life. I, I wrote a lengthy post on, are evangelicals fundamentalists? And, of course, I argue that they are. But there are, there, there are two aspects of fundamentalism uh, within evangelicalism. There is theological fundamentalism and there is social fundamentalism. There's no difference, for the most part, between someone like Fred Phelps at Westboro Baptist Church and Al Mohler with the mm -hmm. Southern Baptist. There, there's just very little difference. Where the difference comes in is, is the social fundamentalism. I grew up in a religion that was very uh, rules-based. Uh, they call it church standards. And so there were, there were rules against everything spoken and unspoken. Now, it's not to say that evangelical, just generic evangelical churches don't have those things because they do. But I think the IFB takes it to a farther extreme. They're much more like the, uh, uh, the holiness churches I, I came in contact with in Southeast Ohio years ago. Long lists of regulations about clothing and dating and hairstyles and jewelry and you just name it and so that legalism i don't like using that term because i think it's misunderstood but i think that's how people understand it that legalism left a very deep imprint on my life because it mm. it, it taught me a warped view of the world and it also crippled my ability to rationally think about the world because the bible said don't do this so i didn't do it so you know, for the first 40 years of my life, I never ate in a restaurant that sold alcohol because it was a sin to mm -hmm. do so. My wife was 40 some years old before she wore a pair of pants for the first time. Uh, we went to a Bible college, for example, that believed that there should be no physical contact between unmarried college students. And I mean, none. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, purity culture gone to the extreme. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and geez, it was, it was the seventies, you know, cause that was the summer of love and yeah, all that free stuff. love, man. Yes. And so now the thing it wasn't is, free for you though. Obviously. No, no. Well, and we broke the rules uh -oh. because they're every dating couple. Did. They do. But, and you feel bad about it and feel shamed and you got to yes. confess and get forgiveness and, yeah, we, we spent two years hoping we didn't get caught and thrown out of school, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so <laughs> uh, we succeeded. But, it, you know, that kind of thinking extracted a heavy pull on us in our thinking and how we viewed the world. And, you know, and so when we deconverted, we had to rethink all of that stuff, Glenn. You know, what is it we really believe? What do we what what's our moral and ethical foundation for life? I mean, we didn't have a TV for 20 years mm -hmm. uh, because we believed it was sinful. Yep. And uh, only like you, we only listened to Christian music. And when, the, when we were in the car, you know, we listened to Christian programming. You know, we never turned to the country station or the you know rock station. It was always Christian channels and the various mm -hmm. programs. And especially for me as a pastor, 
you know, I was out and about all day long. You know, I, like you, I, I drank deeply at the well of a lot of these creatures and, yep. uh, and throw in a little bit of Rush Limbaugh and, you know, some of that other stuff. Too. A little bit of Fox News in there. <laughs> well, we're good Republicans. You know, that's I was at Limbaugh. I was at Ditto Head during those era when I was a pastor, you know, and I, I was a diehard Republican. I voted straight down the line, a party ticket. And that's what I thought, too. You know, that was the godly candidates and all the rest of it. I was trying to explain to my girlfriend the other day what a fundamentalist actually is, because she was raised in a completely non-religious context. And it's really interesting because we'll get into these discussions and she'll ask me questions about my upbringing and my time as a pastor. And she says, I, I don't even think that was you. I can't I can't see you as that, <laughs> per, as that person because we were out in town the other week, went to the Saturday market. And when we came out of a store, there was a bunch of Christians and they had just they were just in the act of packing up. They were handing out tracks and they'd been singing and everything else. And she kind of nudged me in the ribs and said, hey, do you want to get a tract off these people? And then later we were sitting there having lunch at a pub and right across the way from us, there was another table. And it was all these sort of conspiracy theorists, these truthers, you know, anti-COVID. It's all a pandemic and it's all a hoax and everything else. And I said to her, to me, I see a commonality between both of those oh, groups. One's absolutely. religious. The other one is is not per se. But they believe that not only are they right in what they believe, everybody else needs to see the light. Everyone needs to see the truth to the point where they're willing to go out in the town square, set up a table and harass and harangue passersby with their version of the truth. And I said, I can remember doing stuff like that when I was an evangelical, you know, so that shows the depth of that commitment. You believe that strongly in what you think is the truth. Oh, absolutely. And we would. I mean, I, I preached on the street for years and, uh, you know, several times a week and we would hand out tracks. You know, we knocked on every door in our community multiple times and we were true blue believers and believed that, you know, I look back on it now and it's hard to think that we're, we weren't a bunch of Gnostics thinking that <laughs> we had some kind of inside information. Yeah, that other hidden people knowledge. Have. Yes. And so it was our objective to share that inside hidden knowledge with uh everybody else so they could be in on the on the story too yeah, and, but they were spiritually blind though bruce i mean i remember what does it say paul talks about this and i think second corinthians he says the god of this world has blinded the minds uh, of non-believers such that they do not believe that they cannot see the truth so not only did we preach on the streets we had to pray beforehand that our ministry would be effective, that the Holy Spirit would open the eyes of the blind and all this. I can remember having Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses on my doorstep, and this is what Walter Martin would say. He would say, you need to pray for them because they're spiritually blind. They cannot see the truth because they've been brainwashed and everything else, and Satan's blinded their mind and blinded their eyes. So there is that Gnostic piece, I think, to it, isn't there? Or there can be. Yes. Oh, Absolutely. And, and, and it goes back to what we started talking about at the beginning, this whole sense that we're in this uh, spiritual battle between uh, light and darkness, good and evil, uh, heaven and hell, Satan and God. And take that into such a degree that it just becomes a part of everything you do. I wrote a post a couple of weeks ago. I was listening to this one uh, atheist podcast and that I listened to. And one of the, the guys on the show says, you know, basically said that, you know, preachers were just looking for the easy life, that they were drifters. <laughs> I took issue with that. No. Some of them are, maybe. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, most preachers I know were fairly committed to the cause. Yeah. Yeah. And in my case, I was really committed to the cause, yeah. so much so that I sacrificed the economic well-being of my family and, and yeah. uh, the time I could have spent with my children and my wife and Everything else was secondary to, you know, winning the lost and building the church. And now I can look back on it now and say, boy, you sure wasted a lot of your life. Sure, mm. absolutely. But at the time, that's why when someone says, well, you never were a real Christian. And I thought, sure. <laughs> uh, I want you to. I says, you can talk to as many. I pastored thousands of people over the years, and I had scores of colleagues in the ministry. I dare you to find one person 
that would tell you that at the time, Ruskerenser was not a real Christian. Sorry, yeah, you yeah. just not to find someone that, that will say that. You know, it, it's so, you know, I look back on that and I, I think about, imagine living, we lived in San Antonio and we never went to visit any of the sites. Why? Because mm -hmm. I was busy with the church and the Too Christian busy. school, all these things. And, and everything else came secondary to uh, serving God and winning the lost and building up the church. Mm -hmm. I was uh, just going to bring that whole point up because I just recently went through Dave Warnock's new book. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but Childish Things. In fact, I'm going to be interviewing him uh, next week about the book. And um, one thing that really struck me as I went through the book was he talks about how he was just like you and me. He was all in. And you couldn't say he was accused of it. I'm sure you've been accused of it, of you you were never a Christian. You were never a true Christian. I mean, what more could we have done? Right. I mean, <laughs> Bible college, seminary, preaching, sermons, weekend, year in, year out, studying Greek and Hebrew and, you know, unpacking all the theology to try to help as many people as we could to win the lost. And yeah, I went on mission trips to Mexico and Africa and preached the gospel in Nairobi and the slums. And I did all sorts of things. I mean, I was all in, I couldn't have been any more in than I was. And yet I've walked away from it. So what does that say about that claim that, well, Bruce, you were never actually a Christian in the first place. That's one of the arguments I'll use is that people will take that approach with me. And I says, I, what the problem here is, is that, you cannot square my life story with your theology. Mm. It, it doesn't connect because your theology says that once saved, always saved, or we continue to the end, you know, and all, yeah. every perseverance every, of the saints. Yeah. Every school of theology has their own take on that. And so here I am, you can look at my body of work. You can, you can see that I was a true Christian, but yet now I'm an avowed atheist. And so you can't, you can't make that round peg squid it, you know, fit in your square hole there. And so you just say, you know, with the wave of the hand, oh, you never were a Christian. Or the the one I like even better, Clint, is the one where they say, well, you're still a Christian. You're just backslidden. <laughs> right. You just don't know it. You're going to come yeah. back in the fold, Bruce. Maybe you'll have yeah. a deathbed confession and it'll all come sweeping back. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, by now I've had hundreds of Christians pray for me. And so their prayers are not working, but maybe this, will be the day. This, this could be the day. This maybe. could be the day. Yeah. Well, I know you, I'm sure you've been asked this a million times. Okay. So you're a, a long time pastor, independent, fundamental Baptist. You're all in. What was it that, because you mentioned, you kind of alluded to it. You couldn't sustain the weight of all the doubts. Maybe is that what it was like a long transition of that cognitive dissonance that finally built up? It surely couldn't well, have been a one-off, you know, one day you just said, hey, I'm an atheist now, and I just sack it all off. No, I, I think my story has evolved over the years as I think back over, okay, was this really this sudden born-again atheist experience that I had? No, I think it really goes back to my evolving views on politics. Mm -hmm. And year 2000, for example— so that's eight years before I deconverted. You know, I voted Democrat for the first time. I could no longer vote for the Republican Party. By then, I had been influenced by John Howard Yoder and Wendell Berry and some others about my support of violence and war. And I had become a pacifist by then. And so that, you know, those kind of, I have those things, yeah, you know. Floating around. Yeah, it's floating trouble, around. troubling for sure. And I was still, you know, very much a committed conservative Christian, but my politics began to evolve. But really what kind of, you know, brought it all to a head was in 2000, late 2007 into, you know, 2008. We had, I, I had left the ministry in, in 2005. And so we had spent a couple years trying to find a church where we could you know, get involved in and serve God, use our gifts and, you know, all those things we, we say. And, and that became a very frustrating experience. And we, I mean, we attended all sorts of churches from Roman Catholic to Greek Orthodox to Methodist to, to Baptist to 
Presbyterian Episcopalian and and we were we became very disillusioned about what we saw mm. and the experiences that we had and so I was always hesitant to admit that initially because I didn't want people to to say well you left Christianity for emotional reasons mm. you know and I always wanted it to be on intellectual grounds not emotional right. but i recognize that everything first of all everything is political and second everything has an emotional component to it and mm -hmm. so i own that i own that now and but that those experiences got me thinking about the bible and one thing led to another and i i read started reading bart er ehrman's books and then it was john shelby spong's books and all of a sudden, I realized that what I had been taught about the inspiration and it, not the inspiration, excuse me, the inerrancy and the infallibility of the Bible simply were not true. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's I, untenable, I, isn't it? Yes. And so then that led me to a place where I said, now what? And th the Bible was no longer an authoritative text. And so from there, I began taking a hard look at what it is I really believed, you know, and so I started working through the central doctrines of Christianity, you know, the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the resurrection and, and the miracles, you know, that Christ allegedly worked. And, and I came to the conclusion finally by late November of 2008 that I just simply no longer believe that these claims are true. And so for me, it wasn't what else am I if I'm not a Christian? Because I, I don't, if you don't believe these things, you can't be a Christian. Mm -hmm. I, I know there are, <laughs> you know. Yeah, progressive a, Christians, yeah. Yeah, we, have, we live in a funny day and hour about how much people have given away as far as the faith is concerned. And yet yeah. they they hang on to. They'll hang to on the, to something by threads, yeah. man. And, I, and I'm fine with that. I, I go out to eat with a couple of uh very liberal mainline pastors and every month and we have a great time and we have a lot of stuff in common. And, uh, but for me, if I take away all these things that I know that aren't true, I don't have anything that's left, you know? So for a time I claimed the agnostic label, but it wasn't long Clint that I had to explain that word every time, mm, you know, what does that and, mean? Yes. And so finally I says, you know, um, an atheist technically i'm an agnostic atheist but that made it a lot simpler everybody knew what an atheist was <laughs> yeah you can do atheist agnostic you got to unpack a little bit well yeah. the thing is the stakes are so high aren't they because i remember years ago when i was studying preaching i came across an article by john MacArthur, a biblical defense of inerrancy slash inspiration yeah. and taking it on into preaching and his argument is that the preacher can trust that the word of God is indeed the word of God and therefore authoritative and infallible because God himself is a truth telling God. He cannot lie. Therefore, there are no errors in the Bible. You know, that's kind of the line of logic. And when you, as you just articulate, when you start to question and poke holes in that sort of line of argumentation, then the whole thing has to fall down, doesn't it? Surely God himself cannot be a truth telling God. And the rest of it's the implications are just too much, aren't they? Well, yeah, and I, I think you know Bart Ehrman will will tell he tells his story too, very similar background as far as the Bible is concerned, growing up in evangelical churches and whatnot. And so when we find out that that isn't true, then it's like the props have been kicked out from underneath us yeah, in our house, house of cards. You know, I I know if if you ever play the woulda, coulda, shoulda, what if games that we like to play the older we get you know and uh but you know i generally like being a pastor i liked helping people i enjoyed teaching and preaching and so what if my family had been mainline episcopalians instead mm -hmm. would i would i still be in the ministry mm. maybe, yeah, maybe a, if you hadn't been such a fundamentalist bruce <laughs> yeah yes yes, yes. <laughs> it's you true know? isn't it you could have yeah. been one of them liberal pastors going to lunch every month Yes, yeah. Damn, yes. you missed your chance on that one. <laughs> it's not no. too late. Maybe the prayers are now coming <laughs> off full, full circle. That's the answer to the prayer. You need to become like a liberal 
a mainline pastor. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, so, I mean, it's certainly possible that, I mean, I, yeah, I could have taken a different path, but yeah. it doesn't matter because that's not the path that I took, you know, mm -hmm. and the path I took was, you know, had a foundation of biblical inerrancy and infallibility. And when I lost, you know, belief that that, that was true, uh, you know, my house came falling down. The and, whole thing, the whole edifice. Yeah. yeah. You can't yeah. sustain it. Well, I wanted to allude something to something you alluded to before. I wanted to go back around on that. Uh, I know we're getting close to the end of our time. We, you probably have stuff to do, but one thing you mentioned is you, know, you had to sort of unpick all that conditioning because you and Polly were so extreme, you know, fundamentalist, all the rules, the purity culture. What's the best way you found to sort of rebuild your sense of authentic identity? Because that's another cultish aspect, isn't it? Where our religious veneer is is it kind of subsumes our authentic self who are you in, in actuality you've got to rebuild all that stuff or even find it in the first place what have you found that's been helpful for you <laughs> therapy uh yeah yeah <laughs> Honestly, that's true i've decade, had it too you know i remember i i've seen two counselors over the past 10 years and i remember my first counselor who was a a dear friend of mine now, and that's why I had to stop seeing him. We became very close friends. Mm, <laughs> yeah, too close. Yeah, it kind of, yes. But, you know, he talked about my life being this onion that we had to work at peeling one layer at a time to get, because I had lost all sense of who I really was, because all that mattered was Jesus. You know, the joy, mm -hmm. Jesus first, others second, mm -hmm. yourself last, and I said, in, in reality, that meant Jesus first, others second, and you don't matter. Yeah, you certainly know? your family doesn't matter. Yes. Even though they say we're supposed to put our family first, and then God, or, you know, God, then our family, then the church. It never worked that way for me either. It was no, the church no. first, God first. Family was way down the line, just like you were saying earlier. Yeah, and and so from there, there had to be this almost total teardown of my life. And I, I got to admit, it was ugly for a while mm, because yeah. I didn't know what I believed. I, you know, what, do, what do I think about this moral or this ethical issue? And, and so, but bit by bit, I, I developed and certainly Polly did. And we would talk things together about how we viewed the world. And, you know, look, I was homophobic as a pastor. Mm -hmm. I mean, grade A, fire breathing, yeah. homophobic. And, uh, well, I had to rethink that issue a big time, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, look at the harm that beliefs cause. And, and, and for me, it came down to people have a right to live their life the way they want, whether they're a fundamentalist or a, an out and out, you know, Satan worshiper, you know, whoever. Whatever, I, I, yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter. And allowing people the space to be who and what they are. We've certainly had to do that with our children. Uh, they've adopted various beliefs and unbeliefs and and whatnot, and, and they have the freedom, and we accept them as they are. doesn't mean I disagree, but it, it does mean that I accept people as they are. Mm. Uh, but as you know, in fundamentalism, that's never the case. We, we, we never accept people as they are, because if they're not following this narrow regimented path, then their life needs to change. Hmm. They need to conform to the image of Christ, to the image of our interpretation of the Bible. So for me personally, the issues of how to live my life continue to be, you know, a struggle. And, and every once in a while, Bruce, the fundamentalist will still crop up, you know, and some mm -hmm. thought I'll have, I'll, I might see someone the way they're dressed or whatnot. And boom, right out of the depths of that, here it well, comes. My mind becomes something I see. Doesn't take really? much to drag it up, does it? <laughs> it's <laughs> right there. The you know, and, I, and I don't repent. I just usually tell myself, well, that was stupid. You know, yeah. At least we know where it comes from, don't we? Yeah, it, absolutely. It's easy to get triggered too, isn't it? And it, all of a sudden you find out you're reacting to something, and then you've got to go all through the process of okay, where did that come from? What was that about? Why am I feeling such an extreme reaction to whatever it might be, whether it's something like hearing a Christian song on the radio or, you know, that Christianese, 
I mean, even watching that program on Netflix the other night, as soon, like I said, as soon as I heard that hedge of thorns thing, bam, you know, <laughs> it was a little tiny trigger because I knew exactly what they were doing. And I prayed that prayer myself many a time for myself or for others. And you write back in the shit then <laughs> in a way it can be very debilitating. I think sometimes. Yeah. And don't you think we have to, to some degree at, at our age, Careful now, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> we have to make somewhat uh, somewhat of an easy peace, uneasy peace with our past. That mm -hmm. our past left such a deep impression on our lives that if you know how the mind works and we're never going to flush everything out of our, our minds and that stuff's always going to be lurking. Mm -hmm. And But we need to be reminded that we, we can recognize those things and you know, when they come up, you know, try to make corrections, you know, as necessary. And, mm. uh, and, and it's a, and it's a, it's a process and, um, uh, you know, and, and sometimes an uncomfortable process. And I get a lot of email from people, you know, they, I, I think they naively think that well, once I become an atheist, you know, life is going to be grand. Mm. And no, it's really not because you've got to, you have spent your lifetime being conditioned and indoctrinated and you have to undo all of those things in your life. And that's not an easy thing to do. Mm. And that's As why you say, I yeah, rebuild it with a new framework without yeah. the religious aspect to it. And, and that's why I, you know, I encourage people to speak to a professional secular counselor and find somebody that, understands religious trauma, understands mm -hmm. religious indoctrination, and uh, which is hard to find some places. It is. And talk to them because they'll guide you through this stuff and help you see things for what they are. Yeah. And I know in, in both your case and my case, we get a lot of satisfaction out of writing. I know you write a lot. I love your posts on Facebook because I comment on them a lot for anything from American football to you know, yes. letter, you, I love the letters to the editor that you write. You must be that like curmudgeon on the street corner shaking his fists at the kids. Get off yeah. my lawn, you know, but yeah. yes, yes. You, you must be yeah. such a thorn in their side, you know, but someone's got to be the voice of reason, I guess, in your head, you know. So where can people find you? That's the question. Where can they find your writings? And I know, too, you've done some things for the Atheists of Florida. So somewhere floating around, I think it's on YouTube you have a presentation. We both done some things for AOF as well. Yeah. Well, you can, of course, my blog, which is brucegarencer.net. I've done a lot of interviews over the years. There's a page of those on my blog. And you can also punch my name into YouTube and you'll find the various groups that I've given talks to or done interviews with. And then there's, you know, the various, you know, news stories and whatnot I've, you know, participated in over the years. So, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm still hoping someday to get my YouTube channel up and running. Um, mm -hmm. I have learned that it's a great idea, but it's not easy to execute. <laughs> like so many things. It sounds good, looks good on paper, but it's harder to yeah. do. At some point, you just yeah. got to pull the trigger and, you know, yeah. get it done. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's where I am. I, boy, Bruce, you just need to one day sit down and do this. Yeah, just and start I, recording. Yeah. You get better at it the longer you do it. I mean, that's the hope, isn't it? Because yeah. I, I remember I had recent guest on Kerry Noble, who used to be in a white supremacist militia group and everything. And he said he's he's been wanting to do a podcast for three or four years. He's been reading up on it. And I said, Kerry, man, at some point you just got to right. buy a microphone, pull the trigger and just, you know, you'll get better. But if you keep, you know, researching and research, you'll probably never do it. Yeah. And, and that's right. Yeah. I have all the information I need. I have all, yeah. I have good equipment, except for today, of course, can't figure out. The same. <laughs> that was but, a uh, satanic attack, though. Yes. <laughs> that was spiritual warfare. I'm going to lay hands on my computer. <laughs> That's after right. I, uh, that problem will be solved. And, uh, <laughs> if only uh, it were that easy. Yeah. An IT yes. specialist, not a preacher, I think. But this did help. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this on my iPad. And I thought and it worked. Hey, this. This could be the way forward. Yes, this might make it easier for me. And see, uh, there's an answer to prayer in everything. Bless, see, all things work together for the good, Bruce, as they say. 
Yes, you led me to the light. I did. You saw the light. Well, listen, I was going to say, too, before we go, if you're interested, I would love to have you come back on as a guest on our MindShift Zoom call. If you'd love to meet with the people in our group and have a, a chat. So I'll throw you some dates. Okay, and, uh, sure. Maybe, you know, in the next few months, we can line up uh, one of those Zoom calls. I would absolutely love to have you. I think people would just love to chat with you and pick your brains and hear your story. So thank you so much, Bruce. Yeah. Uh, love finally getting to, together with you. I'm glad we made this happen. Thank you, Clint. Enjoyed talking to you.